special thank you and welcome to our speaker today, Paul C. Gorski. He's professor in integrative studies with an emphasis on social justice education. Received his PhD um, in educational evaluation from the University of Virginia and is, in his, in his terms, darn close to completing an MFA in creative writing at Hamlin, Hamlin, Hamlin University. <coughs> Gorski's area of scholarly focus include um, anti-poverty activism and education, critical race theory and anti-racism education, and critical theories pertaining to women's rights, LGBT rights, labor rights, and anti-imperialism. He's published three books and more than 40 articles and has delivered more than 70 conference presentations on these topics internationally. Today he's most interested in examining prevailing discourses regarding these issues and the shifts of consciousness and paradigm that prepare people to engage in authentic, authentic activism. Uh, Dr. Gorski is an active consultant and speaker working with community and educational organizations around the world on social justice and, uh, concerns. He founded Ed Change, which is a coalition of educators and activists who develop free social justice resources for educators and activists. Gorski spent nine years on the board of directors of the National Association for Multicultural Education and serves as well on the board of directors of the International Association for Intercultural Education. He lives in Fairfax, Virginia with his cats, Unity and Buster. Today, in his presentation, Consciousness and Social Justice, Paul will discuss the role of critical consciousness in social justice movements, using anti-poverty activism as an illustrative lens he will commit particular attention to what he calls the consciousness practice conundrum, the pressure that pulls social activists towards a tendency to expend their time and energy on the implementation of practical solutions to unjust conditions, leaving little energy to do the consciousness work necessary for understanding these conditions in their full complexity. The result, as Paul will explain, is a whole lot of activists doing a whole lot of well-intentioned activism that has little to do with the problems that they're attempting to address. He will discuss the implications of this consciousness deficient approach to social justice activism. So without further ado, welcome and thank you again. All of that in 20 minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my background is in community activism and organizing. I, I just want to say that uh, up front, because I, I think often in uh, academic contexts, uh, like George Mason University, a lot of people who come to social justice or however they frame that, come to it through an academic interest in it. Uh, and I came into academia through social justice activism, which I think is often the reverse of what normally happens. And I think that's really important, uh, uh, a place like Mason where uh, students who are getting mentoring in terms of doing social change in the student and, and social activism work um, if they are being mentored by, uh, primarily by faculty who uh, only study this stuff in a sort of philosophical way, but didn't come into their work through uh, activism, I, I think, and this is a big problem in terms of consciousness and social justice activism on college campuses. They think doing, um, you know, uh, if they can just do something that changes something on the campus, that that's the same thing as larger social change. And uh, I, I just want to give you that sort of background in terms of my, where, where I'm coming from, because it affects my lenses in this conversation in a couple ways. One is, uh, it gives me a sort, of, a sort of sense of urgency. And part of that urgency is to understand the problems that exist. And I think, in, especially in the, in the US context, but also in a larger global context, part of the problem with social movements is that, uh, uh, and particularly in capitalist, consumerist context, is that uh, my sense of it, my read of it, is that we're basically socialized from birth not to understand uh, the injustices or not to even see the injustices, especially if there is somewhere that, that we're privileged by them. And so uh, giving me a sort of a sense of urgency to, to dig through that and not keep saying, well, change takes time, change takes time, change takes time. But it also gives me a very systemic view. So I think a lot of people, when they're talking about consciousness, talk about a very individual, like an individual person's consciousness. But I'm also talking about a larger socio-political 
consciousness, a larger sort of community consciousness, or lack of consciousness uh, around these issues. So sort of my mini agenda, one is conceptualizing social justice. I, you don't mind if I stand up, do you? I can flail much better if I'm standing. Uh, not that I have the definition of social justice, but I just, just to let you know what I'm talking about when I say social justice, just so you can sort of follow this. Um, and I want to talk, I, I've been playing around with this idea of the consciousness practice conundrum, uh, uh, which, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, is I, I think this tension between activists who are so desperate to do something, we've got to do something, too much talk, not enough action, let's do something. And I, I fall in, in, into that myself. But the tension between that and between the problem that if we aren't working together on figuring out what the issues are, if we're not doing that consciousness work uh, before we dive right into practice, then any of the activism that we do is going to be misinformed anyway and is probably going to miss the mark. Of, of the social change and that, that we would like to see. And I'm going to give you an example of that around what happens in the discourse around poverty and anti-poverty in, in a U.S. context. Um, and in terms of that, uh, I'm going to sort of set up that illustration through talking about uh, discourse framing and consciousness. So the discourse is around social justice. Uh, how are those framed and how is the way, the way those are framed? And again, I'm going to use the U.S. as a as a sort of a case study here. Um, how do the, the ways in which uh, these discourses are framed inform or disinform sort of the, that consciousness? And then uh, I'm going to talk more specifically about anti-poverty activism. And notice I put anti in quotes, uh, and I put activism in quotes, because my sense of it in studying uh, the anti-poverty uh, discourses and uh, organizations that, that exist right now is that most of them who think they're doing and have all of the best intentions, I think, to do anti-poverty are actually doing work that sustains poverty more than battles against poverty. And so what they're seeing as activism toward uh, a better society is actually further embedding uh, often the sorts of notions and practices and policies that they at least claim to abhor. So that's sort of, uh, does that sound okay to everyone? Is that good? Good, because I worked really hard on this PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, social justice, when I talk, and, and again, there are all different kinds of definitions of social justice by people who are uh, much more, uh, you know, have much more expertise than I do in, in defining and framing these things. But when I think about social justice, I think about movements uh, for the elimination of inequities and access to opportunity and resources. And the, this could be economic access, political access, economic resources, political resources. And uh, so the movements that are, that are sort of working toward those ends, so anti-racism, uh, feminist movement, anti-imperialist movement, queer rights, all of these I think are part of the social justice movement. Part of the consciousness that I think uh, is, is lacking is the fact that what often happens uh, is that people in these different movements compete with each other for resources and for attention. Um, you know, and everyone's fighting over this little piece of pie. And instead of fighting over the fact that they're forced to fight over such a little piece of pie, uh, they're fighting with each other over the, the piece of pie. Um, and I also want to say, in terms of this, although I'm using, I'm going to talk a lot about a specific US context. I think that, too, is a problem of social justice consciousness that's pretty broad within the U.S., that we think of anti-racism as something that we only need to understand in the U.S. context and not in a, in a, a global context, in connection with imperialism or in connection with uh, uh, globalization and the, the globalization of poverty and environmental justice and all these other concerns. Okay, so the conundrum. The consciousness practice conundrum, as I mentioned, outside of pretty well established and highly organized uh, social movement organizations, I just picked a few that I thought people might be familiar with. Um, there are certainly some that have much more sort of radical intervention strategies. Uh, activists tend to be pretty desperate uh, uh, to do something. Uh, and to do, I mean, people obviously within these highly established organizations are pretty uh, 
I think also desperate to do something. But the difference is, in organizations that have been together for a while, uh, they've had the opportunity to sort of construct a philosophy. Uh, they have the resources to, to you know, have teams of people who are actually doing inquiry and constantly collecting information about the problems that exist, what, what uh, issues uh, need, need to be resolved, and, and how to resolve uh, those issues. The problem is, when you have individual activists or smaller, newer sorts of movements, um, uh, what happens is there tends to be this, this desire to act without doing the work to understand the injustices against which we're acting. A lot of my scholarship right now looks at social justice education and the activism, the social justice activism within educational organizations and within education as a larger institution. And I think because that, in a sense, is a fairly new movement around social justice education, around that sort of construction, I think there's that tendency. There are a lot of pockets of people trying to do different things. It's a pretty disjointed uh, movement. And for the most part, my experience sort of being in the midst of that movement is that probably about 80% of the work that's done within the context of that movement uh, has actually very little to do with the social injustices in education. Often it has to do with the symptoms of that injustice. I'm going to talk about that relationship uh, in a second. But it often has very little. The solutions that people are looking for and identifying have very little to do with, with the problems, the underlying systemic problems that, that exist. And I think that's this consciousness practice conundrum. So desperate to do something that we don't spend the energy to fully understand what it is we want to do something about. Um, and then all of this misguided effort. And you know, to be very clear about this, I'm not talking about intentions here. Uh, I'm not talking about intentions. I'm talking about everyone who I assume has really good intentions and that really wants change to happen, at least what they conceive as positive change, uh, which, again, uh, is a problem of consciousness that what, what I, from a fairly privileged position, might see as substantial change is might be very different from, from somebody else. Uh, so I'm not talking about intention. What I'm talking about is the result, what ends up happening, which tends to be uh, recycling what's already in place and maybe just using different language for it. Uh, there are a few uh, conundrums, I think, uh, uh, I mean, a few applications to this uh, conundrum. One is, I think, an oversimplified understanding of the problems. And usually, the way that they're misunderstood is, is that uh, a sort of ignorance of systemic conditions or socio-political context. And so I, I use the example of the racial achievement gap, because that's something that's really in sort of the mainstream consciousness right now in the public schools and are publishing these test results and those sorts of things. But often, um, the people who are working on the racial achievement gap, for the, not, not everybody, but for the most part, the people who are in the trenches working on the racial achievement gap in individual schools and districts are largely attempting to do it without even addressing systemic racism, without addressing the, the larger problem of racism and not seeing the racial achievement gap as actually a symptom of that larger system of racism. And in, in the same way we might see the socioeconomic achievement gap as a larger, uh, as connected to a larger condition of uh, the institutionalization of poverty and the fact that there are people who actually benefit from the institutionalization of poverty. Um, and so my argument is that this is really a problem of consciousness, not a problem of practice. Uh, that, that the problem is not that people don't want to eliminate the racial achievement gap, although there are, that does exist. There, there are people and organizations like that. Um, uh, but a problem of consciousness and a problem of if I delve deeply enough to develop this consciousness, I'm going to have to start contending with the ways in which I'm actually contributing to a problem that I pretend to, to abhor. Uh, the second implication of this conundrum is uh, in order for movements to draw people in, uh, from privileged identity. So in order for an anti-racism movement to engage white people in their movement, in order for a uh, feminist movement to engage men as part of the movement, uh, often the focus on consciousness is withered even further. Um, so racial justice might be reframed as racial harmony uh, because a, a lot more white people are willing to step up to the plate if the cause is racial harmony uh, 
than if it causes racial justice. I'm willing to engage in this as long as I don't have to give up my own privilege, my own protection. Um, and we can say the same thing around, around gender and, and a lot of different uh, issues. Uh, and this also is where social justice itself might be reframed as peace and, and reconciliation. Um, because we don't want to make anybody too uncomfortable. Uh, a couple of examples of the sort of South Africa. Uh, I think about at, at my previous institution, Hamlin, there was an undergraduate program called Social Justice. So students could major in social justice. And really, the program was not a social justice program. It was a peace and reconciliation program. That's what those students were studying. And often, they would study South Africa as the model of social justice. But from a social justice consciousness, what, ha what happened in, social, in South Africa is not social justice because the people who were robbed of their land, who were robbed of their power, who were robbed of their voices, um, they didn't have their property returned to them. The same people who were made wealthy um, through, um, uh, uh, and who were made poor uh, through what was going on in South Africa, that, that hasn't been corrected. Peace and reconciliation, to some extent perhaps, but to say that that was social justice, I, I think, is, is a little backward. Um, but often, again, that's kind of held up as, as the model. And also peer mediation programs, I think, uh, that are very popular in schools, very popular in colleges and universities, uh, where you know, one student will, will make you know, heterosexist or homophobic remarks to another student. To me, that's a social justice concern. Um, and to put that into peer mediation with the assumption that both of these students are coming to the table with the same amount of power when they're absolutely not coming to the table with the same amount of power. Um, the, the problem is this protects the institution as it is. This protects power as it is. Peace and reconciliation without social justice protects power the way that it is. But if we're going to draw people into the conversation, if we're at George Mason and we want the upper, upper level administrators in this conversation, particularly if they are you know, white, male, heterosexual, et cetera, um, then it's easier to get in the door with this and with this than with, well, what are you going to do to eliminate systemic racism on this campus? What are you going to do to eliminate systemic heterosexism on this campus? Um, an example of this, I always like to use the example of Martin Luther King Jr., who is somebody who has con been completely reframed in the mainstream consciousness from being a social justice activist, which is exactly what he was, to being a peace activist, right? So this is what's left of Martin Luther King Jr. in the mainstream consciousness. I have a dream. Ask any high school student what they know about Martin Luther King Jr. And I'll say, I have a dream. Walk into any school, <coughs> elementary school through high school, during February, and you will see a poster with Martin Luther King Jr. and this on it. I have a dream. But Martin Luther King Jr. also said this. And I'm pretty sure you're not going to see that quoted in a US history textbook. And I'm pretty sure you're not going to see that on a poster of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, walking uh, down the middle school hallway. Right? So the whole, the whole discourse is reframed to force us into this, to socialize us into this and away from this. And the amount of consciousness work it takes to even recognize how I've been duped here. Who knows what Martin Luther King Jr. was doing in Memphis when he was assassinated? What was he doing there? Ah. He was organizing sanitation workers. He was organizing sanitation workers. Right? He had harsh criticisms of capitalism and corporate capitalism, right? But where is that in the mainstream consciousness? That's gone. That has been erased from mainstream consciousness. And then the question we have to ask is, well, to whose benefit? To whose benefit is that no longer Martin Luther King Jr.? And that's Martin Luther King Jr. Um, people also don't know that he was an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War. And uh, from a social justice perspective, maybe the most important thing he did was to connect the Vietnam War, uh, poverty, and racism. He was connecting those things, right? And because after all, who was being sent to fight the Vietnam War disproportionately? The third implication of the conundrum is uh, overall, I think what this leads to is a sort of overall resistance to social justice consciousness. I see this in the classes that I teach with uh, uh, future teachers. 
a kind of resistance. Uh, just tell me what I need to do. Just give me something to do. I, I don't want to talk about the issues. I, it's too painful to understand the issues. Um, I might end up feeling guilty or ashamed. You know? uh, so there's this real, and, and even among people who are, you know, have, have been in this work uh, for a while, I think there's this rallying cry, let's talk more action. Let's get past the talk and let's get, let's get to the action. And I, I think there's a sort of implicit resistance to deepening consciousness uh, 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 that, that comes out of that. And to me, this all but guarantees uh, a lack of any, uh, of any real progress in these movements. Um, because the movements are so sort of reframed uh, that the only thing they can do is maybe mitigate an injustice. We'll talk about poverty as an example. Uh, but to make any real problems, uh, to address any real problems in any systemic way in a larger society, first we have to understand those issues in the context of society and larger sociopolitical context. And my sense is that there's resistance to that. And I also think that uh, people, I hear people say that younger generations are more open and more open and more open, and I find the opposite. I think they're more open to celebrating diversity, but they think, you know, my experience is that, uh, especially working with high school students and college students, is that they think that a diversity fashion show is the same thing as anti-racism. That's a problem of consciousness, not a problem of practice. They have the energy to put on the fashion show, so they have the energy to do something. The problem is the lack of consciousness about what is the problem here. Is the problem that there's no diversity fashion show? Is the problem that we don't have opportunities to share our culture, so we need a soul food dinner or an international food fair? Or is the problem uh, something bigger? And then again, the question, the key question for social justice uh, consciousness to me is to whose benefit? To whose benefit is that what we're, what we're moving toward, at least in my read of what's happening? Uh, so the discourse framing, uh, the way that this sort of happens, that uh, I think more and more social justice discourses are framed to encourage that kind of lack of consciousness and that these discourses are often sort of defined as American. So the celebrating diversity or the, the, uh, the mosaic, or what, what's the, what's the other pot. metaphor? The, the melting pot metaphor, right? We're okay with the melt, uh, some people aren't even okay with the melting pot, but generally people are okay with the melting pot as long as that doesn't mean that I have to share my power, that I have to share what I have access to. Uh, so again, reframing MLK. Another person who's often reframed in this way is, um, well, who do you think? Who are some people you think are also reframed in the, this way, where their politics are, are softened? Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gandhi's a good example. Another person from the civil rights movement would be Rosa Parks, right? Because the poster, the most common poster of Rosa Parks has her bending over a cane with a little gray bun in the back of her head like this. And she was in her 30s. She was in her 30s when she refused to give up that bus seat. And she is reframed as somebody who was just too tired that day. <coughs> Not somebody who was active in the, on the board of the local NAACP chapter for 10 years and those sorts of things. And then when someone can't be so easily reframed as being the peace activist, they're reframed as being the, the, the racist or you know, whatever the, the issue is. And a good example would be the Black Panthers who philosophically, in terms of the content of the issues they were addressing, had very similar uh, philosophies to Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, addressing urban poverty, critiquing corporate capitalism. The only difference was that their uh, philosophy about intervention was, was a little bit different. But the work they were doing was exactly the same. Um, so an example of poverty, uh, the discourse on poverty and anti-poverty in the U.S. is largely based even among organizations who sort of fr define themselves around doing anti-poverty work around the culture of poverty myth. This notion that uh, there is a sort of shared set of values and beliefs and behaviors that poor people uh, share. And that's a sort of culture of poverty. And what that, and, and what that has allowed to happen in society is that well, okay, if we want to address poverty, then we have to address the culture of poverty. The, so the, the largest discourse, there's a more progressive discourse going on around poverty, but it, it's often pushed to the, it's often marginalized. The mainstream, 
the, the uh, mainstream discourse on this is largely about how do we fix poor people, right? How do we prepare poor people to get jobs? How do we help poor people learn how to appreciate education? Well, the problem is all the research says that poor people have the, the exact same attitudes about the values of education as wealthy people do, right? But uh, this culture of poverty myth uh, is, remains the sort of prevailing myth, even though um, scholarship showed in the 1970s that there is no such thing as a culture of poverty. Uh, there, I've looked at about uh, 40 studies done from the early 1970s till a couple years ago uh, that tried to identify the culture of poverty, and none of them could actually find the culture of poverty. Uh, it doesn't exist. And yet, the, the discourse in the U.S. still tends to be framed around that. Why? Because it's easy to understand. It's easy to resolve. If, if the problem is the culture of poverty, well, then all we need to do is fix poor people, right? And it's easy to implement strategies. Well, how do we fix poor people, right? We help them desire education. We help them get jobs. So hooray, we actually have something to do, right? But what has been missing from this discourse, and I realize that in the US, we have a hard time getting to any real depth around race, around gender, around a lot of these issues, religion, sexual orientation. But, but I think class is the issue around which we uh, collectively have, have made the least amount of progress. Um, which, actually, I think is harmful to all the other issues because you can't separate out racism and poverty in the US or globally, for that matter. Uh, so, Think about this. When you think about local religious organizations, think about local churches or synagogues or, or whoever, and local nonprofits, and what they are doing in the name, and, and all of the Catholic charities, um, all of these kinds of organizations have whole branches that are focused on doing work around poverty. What, what is it generally that they're doing? Feeding people. Feeding people, what else? Yeah, homeless Okay, right. Raising money, feeding people, housing people, uh, maybe having job transition programs, those sorts of things. Uh, so virtually all that those organizations are doing, you can look at more sort of radical, uh, and see I'm even contributing to the framing when I call organizations who don't do that radical, because it's not radical, it's just anti-poverty, like United for a Fair Economy, who's doing things that, that are a little beyond that. But for the most part, uh, what these organizations are doing are things that really have nothing to do with ending poverty. What, they, what they're doing is sustaining people who are in poverty, right, and sustaining them at a, at a level uh, of poverty, right? So they're not addressing, for the most part, they're not addressing the lack of living wage work. They're not addressing, uh, some of them might be addressing health care in other ways, but uh, not, I think, directly connected to this. Uh, those sorts of things. Those things aren't, you know, they're not doing, uh, you know, economic education around these issues. They're not taking on globalization. They're not taking on corporate capitalism the way Martin Luther King Jr. was taking that on, right? So uh, what I see uh, is that the mainstream anti-poverty movement uh, almost invariably ignores these systemic conditions, right, and focuses on the surface on stuff. And again, this is not because they don't care. That's not because these organizations don't care. I think this is a problem of consciousness, not a problem of practice, that what they're doing is not informed by uh, a real understanding of what the issues are. And again, not, I'm not pointing fingers I, because I think we're all socialized uh, to contribute to that. So uh, strategies for eliminating poverty built on false assumptions that ignore the actual causes of poverty. Um, in most cases, they're sustaining somebody in poverty, provide food, lodging, et cetera, or fixing poor people, but not fixing uh, the fact that in the wealthiest country in the world, we have people who are homeless. Uh, again, a problem of consciousness, not a problem of practice. <coughs> and again, a critical question as to whose benefit, who benefits from the fact that the discourse is created, right? that, that the entry into the poverty discourse for most people is into that discourse. How do we fix poor people? How do we sustain uh, uh, poor people at their level of impoverishment? And this is a pretty famous quote, but I think this sort of uh, captures it. So 
when I start trying to do work that's more authentic, that's when I that's when I'm immediately labeled, labeled communist, labeled socialist, labeled all these things. I'm often labeled uh, called a socialist, and people are surprised when I take it as a compliment. <laughs> so. You know, and again, about the consciousness, moving from just focusing on what can we do, what can we do, what can we do to further understand the problems, I think the questions that need to be asked uh, to deepen consciousness, who benefits from the existence of poverty, I rarely hear, even when I go to conferences that are around uh, poverty, uh, urban poverty, those sorts of things, I rarely hear any real depth of conversation around that question, who benefits from the existence of poverty? How is corporate capitalism tied into the existence of poverty? Who frames the discourse around poverty? Does anybody know who made the, who popularized the term welfare queen? It was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan popularized the term welfare queen. And, and that, when, when he, the first time that he ran for president, that's what, uh, uh, that's what solidified this discourse as that's what re-solidified, that gave rebirth to the whole culture of poverty paradigm. And why systemic conditions recycle poverty, right? So on the one hand, we do have to feed people who are hungry, we have to house people who don't have housing, but if all of the anti-poverty effort goes into that, where are we getting on the problem of poverty? Right? That's a question of consciousness, not a question of practice. So, um, so I just want to end with five challenges uh, these are mostly challenges that, that I sort of point inward when I'm thinking about how I'm spending my time around these issues. Uh, one is that I must always ask to whose benefit. If I, wanna, if I really want to understand deeply any particular social justice uh, uh, issue, if I want to deepen my consciousness about it, the question is to whose benefit. I can look at any policy at this university and I can ask myself to whose benefit is the policy framed this way. Who or what is being protected and who or what is being repressed by this, by this policy, by this article, by this way of framing a discourse. The second challenge must always see intersectionality of issues, right? So just as an example, racism as economic exploitation. Uh, just one example of that, but I have to see the fact that and all these social justice movements tend to be kind of siloed um, and fighting over the same piece of pie, I think it is, is a, a little problematic. So part of that consciousness is seeing the intersectionality of this. And asking ourselves, to whose benefit is there racism and sexism and classism in the gay rights movement? To whose benefit is there racism, classism, and heterosexism in the women's rights movement? To whose benefit is there sexism, classism, and um, heterosexism in the anti-racism movement? To whose benefit? Who's being protected? We must always understand instances of injustice and larger socio-political context, right? So if something happens here around a racist incident, right, that has to be connected to larger you know, often in educational institutions, that's framed as, well, we have to deal with this instance. This thing happened here, and let's talk about that. Um, but there's always a larger socio-political context that frames who has power in the situation and who doesn't have power uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, must learn to think most critically about those things about which we are taught most adamantly not to think critically. Right? So the two-party political system I, and the truth is, when I go outside of the U.S. to do, when I go overseas to do social justice work, most people outside of the U.S. don't even think we have two political parties. They think we have one political party with basically two minor, because once you take gay marriage, uh, abortion, and gun control out of the equation, they can't tell who's who um, outside of those things. But uh, the fact that there's so little conversation about what is so oppressive about a two-party political system, right? That's consciousness. Uh, uh, a lack of sort of mainstream critical discussion around consumer culture, you know, those things. Or the way that capitalism is often conflated with democracy, right? And that happens all the time. And is there, you know, 
Do I even have the consciousness to catch that when that happens? We must understand our own socializations and how they prepare us to comply with peace rather than with justice, especially around the dimensions of our identities that are privileged. And that in and of itself is an issue of consciousness. And I'll just end with this. Um, that even the concept as a white person, the concept of white privilege, uh, the, the notion that I would feel privileged uh, and that I would not have the consciousness to understand what it is that I'm sacrificing in order to get privilege within that capitalist consumerist culture. What am I giving up basically so I can accumulate more stuff? Right? And uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that white people, even white people with a general sort of consciousness uh, about anti-racism would fight so vigorously to protect that, to protect basically their ability to accumulate more stuff in a, in a consumerist uh, context. That's just about how we've been socialized, right? So we have to we have to understand that, or I'm afraid none of us will be much good for any of these movements. Uh, one more thought from Martin Luther King Jr. Can we have someone read this aloud? I just like to get this in the room. Be nice. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. And I am afraid that a vast majority of the effort that goes into social justice is that kind of effort. That I will put an effort to the point at which that tension arises. And at that point, I'll back off. This is a problem of consciousness, not a problem of practice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorski. Um, we, uh, we've got 15 minutes left on the chopping block. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Rogers and Dr. Uh, Webster who will be giving some, some response and catalyzing further conversation. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, if we can think about three to five minutes on, on the responses, that will give us a little bit of time for free flow. And whichever one would like to start. Well, I'll, I'll keep it brief. First of all, thank you very much for, for a great talk. Um, in terms of thinking about consciousness, issues of consciousness, because I think for me, as I um, listen, I was thinking about the difficult challenge that consciousness is a, is a deep challenge. So we're, in terms of the work of the center, we think about what the center is trying to explore. We're exploring a very difficult area, um, this area that you're challenging us to think about in terms of uh, what it is that, that I must give up. There's a, there's a term, agnosia, you know, which is sort of like the fear of knowing. And um, what would it take for any of us to um, engage with someone that differs from us to open ourselves up to a, to a shared dialogue to listen to, for example, a conservative Republican, which I'm not, I, I only put it out there this, to say it's the same kind of a challenge to open ourselves up, to listen, to explore dialogues about race, about poverty, um, are are the most beneficial dialogues that we can have, and they're so hard to have. So I say, you know, what is that inner resistance we have, even when we want to? One of the things you said very early on was sort of talking about the difference between your uh, roots as a social activist and the university, and the different pathways people get to social justice. And one of the things that I thought is perhaps a contribution here is that perhaps the university is a space where the consciousness activity can deepen this idea of introducing students to thinking about systemic change, for example, which I think is uh, it's a challenge for anyone to sort of develop that kind of a thinking, that intersections of issues. Um, but how do we engage our students in that kind of thinking? And I know at New Century it, it happens, but how do we spread that out beyond? Um, I guess the last thing, and there's so many things that you said that were so interesting, and I think you left us with five terrific questions. Um, I just got to thinking about something that uh, Dr. King said regarding research about 
uh, those of us in our research agendas, um, he, he, talked, he challenged people to take the streets of Compton and Watts as their you know, laboratory environments. And I wonder where also our research can take us into um, these kinds of dialogues. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is um, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, and this is very also very uh, thought provoking, and so I'd like to try to be succinct in a couple of examples of of um, the thinking that uh, evolved for me as your, your presentation, and um, and so the the overall framework in terms of the importance of consciousness, um, I could clearly. Uh, um, would like to re-echo that and to, and to say that uh, that it is in those places where the, the social uh, consciousness, not on the individual level as you've distinguished, but in a way of doing an analysis of the broader systemic issues, uh, where that doesn't occur, um, we, we are um, not giving full credit to our ability and our capabilities as, we, as activists and and that in, in many instances, um, it is not a, uh, a, a data set that is unavailable. And in many instances, it's a data set that is available. And, and, and actually, uh, some of the um, points that you raised with regards to the paradox that occurs then within organizations as they are trying to build their organizational structure to, um, to mentor to the minds of many individuals at their various stages. And so that paradox that comes with it with regards to how do you politicize uh, a group of individuals to the, to the knowledge level that could actually f um, have them consistently work on goal uh, is one of the, the, the uh, contradictions and controver uh, controversial issues that come up in growing an organization, sustaining an organization, and then staying on point. So as you say, how do you bring in privileged people or individuals who haven't thought about their status and, and various privileges? Uh, and to socialize, uh, to politicize, um, uh, and to bring them to a new level of inf information um, uh, uh, is often one of the dilemmas that I've, I've perceived in terms of activist organization. And I actually was going to start off with, a, with an example in my own um, history, and to be real quick with it, uh, it was when I found it very important to ask that deeper question was uh, as part of a, in high school, part of a group of folks that, uh, that actually took over the Board of Education for a period of time. And, and after, um, uh, after they began bringing us uh, pizza and, uh, and bringing us movies and, and et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> the obvious question is, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? Uh, so, uh, so I learned from that moment that there's always something significantly uh, important to someone that's going on and it may not be what I know and have learned. And so looking behind the veil and looking behind the, the presentation of, um, of the material that has been provided is, uh, is, has always been a very critical factor. And I see the same kinds of things in our and I, I'm pleased, uh, actually elated, that you're here working in an educational system looking at these same um, issues because I think that our programming, some of which I am charged with, um, with uh, having some stewardship over, our programming uh, provides plenty of examples of um, the dilemma and also the action steps that we have, which. Uh, are to, uh, in some ways, placate and move to the norm, or to a norm of having a conversation around diversity that is not as relevant as the anti-poverty or anti-poverty or, or the social class issues or the or the issues of oppression that is embedded uh, in uh, and need to be examined in our retention policy or or in our mediation policy or in our dialogue process. Uh, just to be real short, one very clear example, if we dissect the, um, the conversation around immigration last year and the call for the university to do something, uh, we had a dilemma. Uh, one of the, part of the dilemma was that there was a group that was saying, we want to do an analysis of the root cause and go after that. And then there was a process that needed to be put in place in order to uh, 
provide some reconciliation in Prince William and in that community. And so what we have in terms of getting started is an example of an attempt to engage individuals who might have the consciousness to go further with regards to the broader um, issues. But very clearly what was put in place and, and what was important to put in place was a process that would create a, uh, a vehicle for conversation that, that wasn't necessarily um, going after the critical issues in that spot, but was forming an entity so that they could build relationship. Whether or not this subset of uh, analysis will happen this year as they're doing some film development, et cetera, et cetera, and that leads to more dialogue and more investigation and clearer thinking um, is, uh, is yet to be seen. But that's a concrete example which I did, in terms of how we, um, we are both part and party of uh, sustaining as well as uh, trying to, to make an intervention. Um, so, thank you. We'll open it up to the floor for a few moments. I, I'll, I'll make uh, one, one quick note that popped into my head. I think Carl Rove probably understood that this conundrum and knew how to leverage it towards uh, his benefit. Because, of course, um, President, President Bush, too, was, uh, was well known for his support of the faith-based organizations. And, how they, uh, they operate. So. The, that kind of reminded me of something else. One of the sort of the, the ways that, that the discourse is embedded, um, I'm kind of in the midst of, of uh, doing a, a study, at least I have actually talked a lot about, about doing this, where uh, looking, at, uh, um, looking at the transcripts from the presidential debates, the most recent presidential debates, um, and in those, I think there are four of them. In those debates, the word poverty was not mentioned once. Poor people were not, working class was not mentioned once, um, even by Obama. The only mention of poverty actually came from McCain. He made one comment about uh, poor people finally having equal access to good schools, uh, which is not true. Uh, but Obama never mentioned poor people, poverty. His term was middle class. All that he talked about was middle class because he never he knows that the discourse that people were socialized to hear was the middle class discourse. You know, people see themselves as middle class, which again is an issue of consciousness. Poor people see themselves as middle class. Wealthy people call themselves middle class in, in, in the US. Uh, it's really interesting. So one of the, oh, oh, Mark Dennis. Um, speaking as a white privileged male, and realizing what I'm about to say may just be a clever kind of self-justification to hang on to privilege. Um, I think when we raise consciousness, sometimes we move to a perspective that um, is paradoxical. And your powerful question about who benefits is really hard to face up to the way I benefit by a lot of these injustices. At the same time, I also don't benefit from that. And to the extent that I can hold the tension of seeing how I'm privileged and I benefit, and also recognize that I'm impoverished by living in a society where there's this kind of difference and fear-based tension within the culture. It, it also um, wounds me. Yes. And as long as I don't use that as an excuse to, to not look at the way I'm also very privileged. Yeah. I, I've been looking a lot also at the discourse around white privilege, which I find really fascinating. And first of all, the people who are benefiting from that discourse mainly economically are white people. It's white people who are going out and making big money giving talks on white privilege. Um, but what's interesting about it is I see a kind of developmental process. On the first end of the developmental process, it's white people understand you benefit from white privilege. And, and if you try to say you don't benefit from white privilege in the context of that discourse, somebody will correct you very quickly. But there's a part of that context, if I step back from that and understand white privilege in a bigger context, which, um, and this is a piece about consciousness, it, I have to have the consciousness to be able to make this bigger connection. Then it gets to the point where you said, I, I benefit from it in a capitalist, if I'm using the construct of benefit as, as a capitalist consumerist construct, that's where I benefit from it. Or that, for instance, uh, 
I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to be hounded by police or, or whatever. Um, uh, but the other side of that, the consciousness takes me to, to a point where I say, in the bigger scheme of things, in terms of my spiritual wellness and that sort of thing, uh, I don't, I'm hurt by this, I don't benefit from it, but the, the difficulty with that is being able to focus my energy there in and of itself is a product of white privilege. Mm -hmm. And so, so I don't know where the hell that leads us. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that struck me as I was listening to this, and I, sh I should precede this by, by saying that I, I grew up in a culture where it was perfectly acceptable to claim and proudly wear the label of socialist. So, um, but, <laughs> um, but, but one of the things that struck me is, as we came to this, this last moment and talked about the problem of consciousness, and it seems to me that maybe what, what underlies that is, is, is where the individual pins his or her sense of self within a larger society, whether whether that sense of self is attached to me as an individual, or whether that sense of self is attached to the nation or the society as a community. And one of the things that's been very much on my mind recently because of the debates um, in the US about national health care was going back and looking at the kind of um, changes that were made in Britain at, with the introduction of the, the National Health Service. And, and what was really striking about that was that the, the many, many people at, at multiple levels of, of, of privilege um, within the society who were willing to accept, in some cases, quite considerable individual loss in order to make what became a massive communal Gain, you know, because their identity, their, their, where they placed their consciousness was not with me, but with that larger society um, as, as a whole. And you know, and, and I wonder whether, as I, as I listen to your to, to your discussion, whether we need to actually st start to help our students identify and, and, and think think about that. That you know, can you survive in a society, or perhaps more importantly, can a society survive with you in it if your only identification is with yourself as an individual? And, and I think even, and I think even the next step is to engage them in a conversation about how they've been socialized mm -hmm. to get there in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they can see that happening. And that's I find that nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but I keep trying. It's easier, and I think sometimes it's easier for me because I can just say, okay, I come from this other place. Yeah. You know, and. <laughs> Let's go ahead and add, add uh, two minutes to the afternoon, and, and Dennis and, and So one of the thoughts that come up is, uh, for me, is um, what level of um, uh, insistence or incorporation of this uh, ability to to have one focus on uh, their sense of consciousness do we inculcate into our uh, call for students to be engaged in volunteerism, um, because that's a tricky kind of process. Um, and, and so if we do that, if we, if we create and, and provide these, these um, uh, educational imperatives, which is what we're actually coupling it with, it's becoming an educational and developmental imperative, and yet we're not clear about part of the outcome and goal being to further the ability to gain a various, a different level of consciousness uh, in this framing um, than we do and p continue to perpetuate um, more activity uh, that is not necessarily linked to, uh, and, and feel good activity, uh, but it's not necessarily linked to uh, the creation of entities that will really break through the cycle that uh, we see repeated uh, over and over again. So. Um, this is more of a comment, just that this, this quote and um, your references to race of Martin Luther King Jr. kind of reminded me, um, probably because of the consciousness, but you know, people like W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, you know, one of whom is really tackling the structural systemic issues and saying, you know, let's have the talented temp program, let's get people into um, 
schools and, and colleges and into the system where we can make a difference. And then you've got somebody else who's saying, we got to deal with the reality. You know, people need jobs. They need to survive. They need to do that. And so, and so I look at this, you know, you, you read the debates that they had together, and it, it just sort of strikes me that it seems that today there's less of that there's less of that dialogue where we hold up several different individuals who have very different ideas of how to approach problems so that the way that we talk about justice, social justice right now, is to have the homeless, you know, feed the homeless programs and the food drives and the charity things around the holidays, but the, the powerful voices that deal with some of the systemic changes aren't are forefront in our consciousness, the way that I think we study them historically. Why that is, you know. I had a conversation related to that with my mother last year, uh, last winter, and she's very proud that every year they do this, you know, sponsoring Christmas for a family mm -hmm. sort of thing. And she really sees that as part of, you know, playing her part. And I'm like, well, you know, people are hungry at other times of the year. You know, stuff needs to happen, and and um, and just sort of, sort of trying to push her to think about, well, what can we do that addresses the problem that this kind of help is needed, is necessary? And that is much more, much more difficult. And, and not only is it difficult, I think, philosophically, for her at least, but uh, I think it's difficult emotionally. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Gorski, for sharing your ideas. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Dr. Rogers and Dr. Webster for uh, responding.